This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caregiver Chronicles. My name is Sarah, and today I have Jessica Pate with me. Jessica is a mom to a son with a rare genetic disorder called prater willi syndrome. She is passionate about serving caregiver communities and creating authentic communities. She founded the We Are Brave Together organization, which helps over 2,600 moms around the world. She is the host of the podcast Brave Together with Jessica Pate. She also just launched the book, Becoming Brave Together, Heroic Extraordinary Caregiver Stories from Mothers Hidden in Plain Sight. Hello, Jessica, and welcome to the show. Hello, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here and taking time to chat with me today. Um, Can you please further introduce yourself to my audience? Of course. I am from Los Angeles, California, and I've been married to my husband for 27 years. We have three grown-ish kids. Our oldest is 23, Luke, who's in college, has a semester left. We have Ryan, who is our son with PWS. He's 21 almost. And then we have Kate, who is 18. And Ryan has a rare genetic disorder, like you said. And I say that Ryan's the one who made me a caregiver. Although my other two were late diagnosed with ADHD and definitely have struggled with anxiety. So I have three kids all on unique and sometimes worrisome paths. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I want to ask, I don't know, I don't know a lot about crater willy syndrome. Um, can you explain what that is to my audience? Absolutely. So when Ryan was born, he couldn't cry. He couldn't suck. He could hardly move. He was born with really low muscle tone. And so we spent a month in the hospital not knowing and running tests. And we thankfully got an early diagnosis when he was five weeks of age. So when you read about it, it's a crazy mix of symptoms. Ryan doesn't get sick often, but it is considered a medically complex disease or disorder. Um, He, um, he had all his milestones delayed. So when you have low muscle tone, you need all the early intervention services, OTPT and speech. He had a feeding tube his first year because it took that long for his mouth to catch up and to be able to take a bottle without relying on the G-tube. And he um, walked at age three. And one thing that is indicated for PWS is growth hormone. So he started that as a baby. And even with growth hormone, he still didn't walk till he was three. So he was just so, so low tone. Um, fast forward in the childhood, early childhood years, um, there is an insatiable food drive that kicks in. That's a piece that might make the news because it's just such a crazy feature of the syndrome. Kids go from failure to thrive often as babies, not every baby is diagnosed with that, Ryan was, to then being hyper-focused on food because they never feel full. There's no satiety, there's no satisfaction, there's no, I've had enough. So it's a double whammy too, because kids with the syndrome usually have low metabolism. So they get less than everybody else and they want to eat all the time. Ryan's food drive, what we call it, uh it was a slow burn so we didn't have to lock up our kitchen until he was 13 and by the time he was 16 we had to become extremely vigilant and make sure we never ever ever leave it unlocked even for a second to run to the restroom so um also it's a spectrum disorder uh kids are some kids are more affected than others academically cognitively behaviorally The food drive can also look different with different kids. I'm on a thread with several other PWS mommies for the last, I don't know, decade or two. 
And it's interesting how the food drive can be displayed a little bit different, but all of them have it and all of them have it forever until there's, you know, a magical drug that takes the edge off. And even kids who are higher functioning, a small percent might go to college. They still have to be watched because of that food drive. It's life threatening. So even though they, you know, can handle a regular high school load academically and then go on to college, somebody has to support them and be with them so that they don't take food. Yeah. Wow. That sounds, you know, just like a lot. And I can relate in, in a certain level with having to lock the fridge and the cabinets and, um, with my son who doesn't have the full button also, um, or sometimes he does, but usually not really, Mm -hmm. um, high, highly preferred foods, especially he'll eat them until he throws up and it's, and it's scary when that happens and it's, you know, it's upsetting and, you know, it's very frustrating and explaining it to people, is also very difficult. Um, Right. Right. So I can relate in that aspect, the rest of the story, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's things. Um, So you said he was diagnosed at five weeks with Prader-Willi syndrome Mm -hmm. and that there were early, early symptoms. Is that, uh, you said that that was a little bit early. Is it typical diagnosis as babies or is that more something you see in older children? I think more and more we are seeing early, early diagnoses like that. I just talked to a new mom and her her baby was diagnosed at two weeks of age. So I think we're getting better. Um, I think if your baby is able to syringe feed or suck a little, it could get missed in the beginning. But Ryan was so severely affected. You know, he was having medical issues at the beginning. We had a lot of specialists in his life the first year. Um, And because he didn't wake up for food, he didn't cry. You know, he, he was more than just a mellow newborn, you know, Uh, it was very apparent something was going on. So I'm grateful that they started running tests. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Anytime you can, the earlier you catch a condition, a disease, a medical problem, anything like that, the better results are in the long run with most conditions or at least the better quality of life you can provide Mm -hmm. uh, as far as that goes. So I want to talk about when the diagnosis happened and Mm -hmm. um, I can imagine it must, I can't imagine it must have been hell. Um, literal hell to be there with your child going through all this. How long after that did you start becoming brave together? And um, how long after that did you realize that there needed more support? Let's go back. So I started We Are Brave Together. That's the name of the organization. Um, I started that in 2017. So Ryan was 14 at the time that we launched. But I knew in the early years, because we we had gone to our first support group when Ryan was two months of age because there was one in the Los Angeles area, thankfully. And we found our people, we found friends, we found people who were in Southern California who had kids different ages with PWS. And so it was such a comfort. It was so, I mean, I just exhaled so much anxiety and worry because I had people to walk the journey with. And so, you know, that cemented it to me how important community and connection is, whether it's with other parents whose children have the same diagnosis or different diagnoses. Because again, when Ryan entered the school district at age three, we found more families to do life with and they all had different diagnoses. And it was just so nice to have people to ask questions or, you know, who's a good psychiatrist around here or, you know, what kind of services are you getting? You know, we learn so much from each other and we can just validate each other's experiences and emotions and fears and wonders and what ifs and all of that. So I've always definitely been a gatherer, a connector, a group, you know, person. Um, I love my girlfriends. My girlfriends are my family, always have been. And so you know, to just fall in love with the power of community was very natural for me. And so I just wanted that for every caregiving mom to have people that understood them and validated them. Yeah. And that's a hard thing to find um, for moms who are caregivers. Um, I think 
I mean, all moms are caregivers, but like you said, caregiving mom, I love that term because it's, it's what we are, you know, our journey taking care of our child is not going to end when they turn 18 or 21 or 25. It's, it looks different. And it's something that you, you really only find that sense of community with moms that are in that situation. Moms of neurotypical kids, kids who don't have all the medical diagnosis, things like that. Um, they try their best to understand. A lot of times they try so hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got to applaud them. But like, I know, I know my mom friends, they really do try their best, but there's just things that they'll just never get. And I think that finding the community within where you are is scary because it's like, well, what am I walking into? I don't know these other moms. It can Mm -hmm. feel intimidating, but it really is like so, I don't know. I want to say relieving when when you get in there, you know, um, it's like, it's like, it's intimidating because I always find other parents intimidating other people, you know, especially in groups that have known each other. But like, again, when you're in there and you're in this crowd and you're like, oh my God, these people understand me on a level that like my own people don't understand me. Mm -hmm. They become your people. They do. They become your people. I love that. I always say it's comforting and transformative to be surrounded by people who get it, who understand. You don't have to over explain. You don't have to apologize for your tears. You know, there's no judgment. You just get to be yourself and to share your story. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I want you to talk about um, We Are Brave Together and your organization more and what you do to help moms connect. Thank you Um, so much. I know you do retreats and things like that in support groups. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you want to get into how that started and what those look like? Absolutely. So, you know, our intent when we launched We Are Brave Together was really to support caregiving moms to really emphasize, you know, preserving and protecting their mental health by everything that we are offering. So we started off in 2017 with, you know, a local support group that moms could attend in person and one retreat. out in Rancho Mirage, which is in the desert Palm Springs area. And that's where we began. And and then we just kind of exploded from there. We, um, our support groups are called connection circles. We have them all over the United States. I would love to get to Connecticut. Um, We do have actually one of our leaders is in Connecticut and her group is a virtual group for moms who have kids with behavioral challenges and aggression. So she's a wonderful leader. It's a virtual offering. Um, So we have connection circles all over the place, mostly by geography, sometimes by topic, sometimes by diagnosis. Um, Most of them are in person. Some are virtual. Some are a mix of virtual and in person. They're all led by caregiving moms who really understand what this is like. And then uh, we offer low-cost weekend retreats to give moms a weekend of rest and respite and fun and connection and mental health education. So a typical weekend would be arrive at four o'clock, we'll have an introductory session, we'll have dinner together, and then some get-to-know-you time after that Saturday. Um, and we have a speaker. We have a retreat speaker and a retreat coordinator for every retreat. Um, our speaker will lead the group times together, and usually there's four or five of those. Saturday morning, there's usually two um, big sessions uh, with a break in between. Of course, um, we provide all the meals, so five meals, unlimited snacks, group times, downtime. We wrap up on Sunday mornings with um, you know, kind of a, a wrap up for the weekend. What are your takeaways? What are you going to apply to your life as you go back? Because we know we cannot change circumstances but we can change you a weekend away with other women who get it can change you. And then you are resourced as you go back to your life. And then uh, retreats end at 11 o'clock. We pack up, clean up. We um, usually like to rent homes for our retreats because there's just a cozy private factor. We have one retreat in San Diego that is just at a hotel, but often our retreats are at a home or a home and a hotel for overflow so that people can have beds to sleep in. And we only charge $300 for our weekend retreats. And then we offer a minimum of three scholarships for every single retreat that we offer. And we've grown from doing one per year to nine. And I think for 2025, we have 10 or 11 scheduled and we're going to get to New England as well. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, And I think like, thank you so much for sharing that because that's amazing. I think um, 
I think, again, offering scholarships is important for those types of retreats because caregiving moms don't always have the resources to get there. And, you know, the more opportunity is great. And I know, you know, as, as I stated before, you serve over 2,600 women that you connect. I would imagine that not all of them, this isn't like, a, um, and I'm not, I'm not like, please don't anyone take this personally if you do Mary Kay or whatever. Um, it's not like a Mary Kay like retreat or like, you know, you know, or like the Arbonne ones where like everybody from the company is there. Um, it's, <clears throat> it's smaller groups, correct? Correct. It's an intimate retreat. So it could be, you know, 12 to 15, 16 moms. We've done everything from like 12 to 35. And we think 15, 16, including the speaker and coordinator are kind of like a, a really good place. And so for some that feels too intimate for some that feels just right. Um, we do plan on doing a big conference in 2025 or 2026 because that has been asked for. So a hundred or 200 parents, you know, being able to attend, we try to offer everything that we can for free. Our retreats are not free, except we do offer the scholarships. Our podcast is free. We don't have subscriptions for anything. Membership is free. You can access all our content, you know, on our website, on Instagram, everything is, is free. We just want to make things accessible and equitable. That's awesome. And that's well appreciated. And I know in the caregiving mom community, because that's what, again, you know, being able to afford the basic thing sometimes is a big concern for caregiving moms. Never mind the extra for me stuff. So it's great that yes. you do that. Um, and I definitely like the smaller group for the retreat. I would be intimidated going with, you know, 30 or 40 people. Um, now, do these moms, usually when you set up a retreat and you have people together, do they usually know each other beforehand? Um, or is it, it's all new, everyone's new to everyone? It's, a, it's always a mix. Someone might come with somebody they know or, or a few people that they know. Oftentimes people are going just, you know, on their own. So it's a mix. Awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I want to talk about your podcast also. Um, would you like to tell us more about that? Sure. It's called Brave Together. Um, it, we are going to go through a little bit of a change for season seven. We're going to change our art and we're going to change our title. Um, and two of my co-hosts for the Ask Us Anything episode are probably going to be hosting some additional episodes. So it'll be more of a more collaboration, which is wonderful. Um, so we currently, we've been doing three types of episodes, a story episode. So a mom, a dad, a sibling could send in a story. And if it's approved, then we produce a story episode. And um, we also offer the Ask Us Anything, which is with a coach and a psychologist. So Susanna Peace Lavelle, who's a coach, and Dr. Zoe Shaw, who's a clinical psychologist, they are on the show, somebody calls in with a question and we dive in to answer it. So for example, one recent one was, you know, how can I be more playful or lighthearted when my life is so serious? Such a great question because we need to be able to access play and joy and lightheartedness and humor in the midst of chronic hardship, right? And then we also do, historically, we've done a lot of practical episodes where we bring in an advocate, we bring in an expert, we bring in an attorney, we bring in a coach or a therapist on a particular topic. For season seven, which um, will be this fall, 2024, we're going to do some different things. So that's awesome. Seven seasons of a podcast is a pretty big deal. So um, that's awesome. And kudos to you on that. And then I know the the big reason we're here is to talk about your book, um, Becoming yes. Brave Together. Um, I know that you, it's not just your story. It's many stories. So share the inspiration for the book, please. Thank you. So the inspiration for the book is, you know, well, there's a lot of reasons of why. One, um, I wanted to give a voice to other moms. I've, you know, had a platform. I've been very vocal, you know, on social media. And since starting We Are Brave Together, you know, I've had an opportunity to use my voice so many times. I wanted other moms to be able to use their voice and to share their story. Um, secondly, I know that when you read 22 stories versus just one story, I could have done my own book. Uh, but when you read 22 stories, 
your eyes, your heart, your soul, your mind opens up in a way that might not open up when it's just one story. I think this is my own psychological theory. If I am the only person in somebody's life who has a child with a disability, if I were the friend or family member, it would be easy to minimize how intense and extreme that my life is, right? If I'm on the outside and I only know one story, but if I read 22 stories, wow, right? I'm going to be impacted. I'm going to have a glimpse. I'm going to have a greater understanding of what everyone goes through because even though we're representing different diagnoses, we're representing different ages of kids, there are so many universal themes that come through. So, um, yeah, and I just really wanted to, you know, shout the worth of caregivers and caregiving because we are a marginalized group. We are an isolated group and we want to be seen. We want to be heard. We want to be understood. And, and I hope that the book will inspire and encourage and implore people to offer tangible help. I mean, just taking simple to do items off of our list. We're not asking for childcare. Childcare would be great. But if you offered to go to the pharmacy for me or pick up my groceries at Costco or go with me to doctor appointments, I have so many doctor appointments, just go with me, just be a second set of hands. How lovely would that be? So I hope that the book inspires people to offer more help. Yeah. And I love that idea. And I also really like the um, title and, you know, what you were saying, being hidden in plain sight. And, you know, I know that a lot of times with my family, that's, that's how we feel. Like sometimes like, like we're out there, we're taking our kids everywhere we can, but um, sometimes it feels like you're hidden in plain sight. And I know a lot of autism families, a lot of families with kids with special needs, they cannot take their kids to places because- because of fear, because of stigma. Um, I can give you a really good real life example. A few months ago, we were at the zoo with a friend um, and her family. And my son went up to look at the animals and, you know, and their things. And the other kids would side eye my son and slowly scoot away. And the parents, instead of being like, oh, say hi, they'd say, come on, let's go. Um, And (laughs) kind of shoo their kid away. And I'm so sorry. Um, it's it it is a really like frustrating thing to deal with. The pro of that, the only pro of that is I was there with my other friend and she had three kids and my kids there are four other kids in this group. So as soon as the other kids left, it's like, okay, guys, go, go right up front now. Right. Um, so you know, it was it was kind of a like their loss situation, but how do we like Like, how do we prevent, I know we can't control other people's behaviors, but how do we get seen more, I guess? Well, I think we need to hand this book to everybody, right? I gave it to everybody on Ryan's team. Obviously, they've all chosen to work in special education, but still, it will make them different when they're out in the world. So I think the more we can get this book and books like this into the hands of the general population, I, my hope, Um, And I'm very idealistic is that, you know, this will create more empathy and more awareness and take away some of the fear. Maybe more people will say hello. Maybe people won't scoot their kids away. Maybe more people will learn how to connect with pain and chronic hardship versus just shying away, not saying anything, not acknowledging. And I think, and again, I think that that's um, really good. I think, again, if you're not a reader, there's, you know, there's your podcast, there's my podcast, there's millions of podcasts out there with advocacy. Um, there's all kinds of resources and even just asking questions. I, I also want to give another example of being in the zoo. We were walking through, my son had his talker and another kid was like, hey, how come he gets an iPad at the zoo? Like, I don't get one. And I was <laughs> like, oh, that's that's his talker. Um, and the parents were like, oh, yeah, you know, you can bring him over and show my son and say hi. Um, and oh. this is what we need more of. You know, the kid was curious. Yeah. You know, and, and kids are going to be curious and that's mm-hmm. normal. It's mm-hmm. what's not what's taught is when the adults are shooing their kids away or, you know, giving that's where they're learning the behaviors of like, 
stay away from someone who's different mm-hmm. versus mm-hmm. how to accept and acknowledge someone who's different. Um, yeah, and I think we also need to stay open. So when people do approach us and, you know, if they say the wrong thing, but you know, their intention is good, stay open, stay soft, have some compassion and appreciate that they're just trying to make conversation. They're just trying to acknowledge you and let's give people grace. And then that will spread. You know, I think if people are greeted with, you know, snark or um, hardness or, you know, it's not going to help the problem. And I, I don't want to minimize, and I'm not talking about when someone outright is just really says something like ignorant or just where they speak without thinking. Right. And it hurts and it stings us. That's not what I mean. I just mean when somebody, you know, says something, you know, we've all heard, okay. Um, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. Right. And I, I don't ever want to hear that again, but if someone says it to me, you know, I'm going to try to stay soft and, and maybe if I can have an opportunity to say, well, this is kind of how I interpret that. Thank you. I know you're trying to make something positive out of something that's really hard. Thank you for, you know, trying, if we have the guts and the bandwidth that day to say that, you know, but I think, um, I think we have to stay open as well and soft and, and give people grace. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And I, I couldn't agree more. Um, also I, could get on a whole tangent about the God doesn't give you more than you can handle thing or the, um, we're just, we're praying for you to get through this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Pray for the rest of my life then get the through rest what? of my life. Get, get, get through, through what? what? I know. Right? I know. There's I know no it doesn't through. end. There's nothing to get through. Unless I, I you're know you're talking about a hard season, right? But- exactly. Like I know your intentions are well, but like there's no other side. <laughs> This is right. just my life. There's no promised land. <laughs> and you, well, you have to laugh about it because you know, you know, in your heart that they mean well. They do. But you just want to scream. Can you come do the dishes for me? Or can you just yeah. sit with him for an hour so I can breathe? You know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> you just want to scream those other things. Yeah. And I think, and again, I think that that's, that's all caregivers want is support you know, um, Mm -hmm. like the physical Mm -hmm. support, not the, we're praying for you. We're thinking about you. Right. The thoughts and prayers thing. Like that's no, I need you to (laughs) like do dishes with me or for me or bring me dinner or give me a DoorDash car. Like, just please do something tangible. And exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, it's, it's so fun to talk to someone who completely gets it because it's like, (laughs) We're all over, like, we're all over the thoughts and prayers. And when you get to that point, it feels cold, but it's, it's really, it's just, you've just been living in it, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And I also want to talk, I, another thing that we really are aligned on is self-care and our mm -hmm. our views on Mm self-care. And um, your quote is saying self-care is not a curse word. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Would you like to elaborate on that? (laughs) Yeah. I, you know, it's like, we need to come up with a new term because I feel like it's now gotten a bad rap and people roll their eyes and it feels like something to be added to the to-do list and a chore and don't tell me to do that. I'm just trying to survive. And I understand that. I know what it's like to be in seasons where you are stretched so thin. Like, you know, the, the way I describe it's like, If you've ever felt a balloon that is blown up so tight, like if you breathe on it, you feel like it's going to pop. I know what it's like to feel that way mentally, emotionally, you know, when seasons have been so tough with my kids all at once. And the idea of self-care was like, are you kidding me? I just want, you know, some chips, my purple blanket and Netflix, like, don't even talk to me about self-care, but I made myself go to yoga. I made myself get outside. Even if it were a five or 10 minute walk, I made myself do the things that I know sustains me for the long haul of caregiving. And that's you know, you have to believe that you are worthy of investing. You have to believe that your mental health as a caregiver matters. Or I could give you, we have a list on our website of bite-sized self-care suggestions compiled by actually two of our contributing authors. It's a beautiful list. It's, you know, there's a lot of stuff on there that's free and doable. But if you don't believe that you deserve to be invested in, 
then you're going to roll your eyes. You know, we're not talking about, yes, a massage might help, go get your nails done, but that's self-comfort. That's not going to sustain you for the long haul. The things that sustain you for the long haul, the true self-care is the internal shifts that go on in us, you know, a gratitude practice, um, things that help you feel centered, grounded, help you access joy or peace or playfulness. Those are the things that really make a difference. You know, watching Netflix, I love me some TV. I grew up a TV head, but that's not going to sustain me. It's a comfort and an escape while you're in the midst of it, but it won't change your mental health. It won't at all. And I, I agree with that in a sense, but I think also you got to meet yourself where you're at with self-care. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you really just can't that day or, you know, and, and that's what you need is your favorite snack or your favorite beverage or your favorite TV show, just, just yeah. to get, just to survive. Then, you know, I think in that level, it is self-care, but get yourself out of the, out of the, you know, lowest level of self-care and work your way up. Okay. What's the next thing? And again, if it feels like a chore, if it's a self-care activity that feels like a chore, like journaling for me really isn't fun. Yeah. Right. Um, I've tried yeah. it. I don't like it. I find it. Yeah. It's just not for me. Mm-hmm. And so, you know what? It's not my go-to self-care. Um, music is though. And yeah. I think it's accessible for everybody. We can all put our favorite songs on or, you know, our little playlist and have a dance party and you yes. can do that almost anywhere. Um, yes. Yes. You get to decide what true self-care feels like and is best for you. There's no, like, you have to do this and you have to do that. You get to decide. Absolutely. And again, I think, again, and I agree with you too, like keeping it accessible, you know, it doesn't need to be massages. It doesn't need to be shopping sprees. It doesn't need to be a fancy dinner. Um, whatever, whatever is accessible, even if it's just going in your backyard and like sitting down and listening to the birds or whatever your thing is, do it, you know, make, make that time, make that hour, half hour, whatever, even if it's 10 minutes that you Mm -hmm. go outside every day and just look around outside Mm -hmm. your favorite tree. (laughs) Oh, the other thing I want to make sure I say is that I think, um, self-care can get a bad rap because the word self is in there and people think of it as selfish. Well, to take care of your mental health is actually not selfish. So if you frame it like that, I am taking care of my mental health. It's not about, you know, going to the gym for three hours and leaving your children unsafely behind. It's, you know, there's nothing to feel guilt about taking care of your mental health because you are trying to sustain yourself for the long haul of caregiving. Exactly. And nobody would call you selfish for going to the doctor. Um, No, no. (laughs) You know, (laughs) Like, like it's, and that's just a point blank. Like you're not selfish for taking care of your physical health. Nobody's going to call you selfish if you eat an apple. Um, so no. it's no. not selfish to go for a walk or do something right. that makes you feel good. <laughs> so true. we're definitely in a good alignment with that one. Um, and that kind of gets me to my second to last question and my favorite question to ask all of my guests What is your favorite form of self-care? I would say my favorite right now has been hot yoga for quite some time. I just, it's grounding. It helps me be grateful. I sweat out a lot of stress. Um, The studio where I practice is just, has a great vibe. Um, So that, you know, I make, I'm committed to that at least three times a week. So that's my favorite. I would say um, next to that would be live music if I can get to it. You know, that's a treat. That's a privilege. Um, And writing, you know, just writing, you know, just spilling out what is, you know, coming from within. It's just, it's so cathartic. I don't know. It just feels so good to put words together. Yeah. I think that that's great. And I think anything exercise that you can do is great. Um, obviously anything like writing for your mind and again, music for your soul. Um, I think, <laughs> yes, you know, mentally stimulating. And again, I think that that's something that we forget with caregiving that we need. Um, 
we need to, we need to take care of our bodies. We need to take care of our mental health. We need to take care of our, not just our mental health, but like our mental health as far as like mentally stimulating, not just, not just keeping us calm, our spiritual health, our Mm -hmm. social health, all these things, you know, makes us the whole person that we are. And we need to take care of all of that. And it's not selfish. I appreciate that. Yes. Very true. And that's, you know, that's exactly what you're doing with We Are Brave Together. Um, You're making sure that all those cups are full for moms like me and families like ours out there. So thank you so much for what you do. Um, Finally, where can my audience find you for more information? If you go to wearebravetogether.org, you can see everything that we're offering, everything that we are about. Uh, you can find us on Instagram at We Are Brave Together. You can find Becoming Brave Together on Amazon. We have a digital and a paperback version. And then you can find our podcast on all the platforms. It's right now it's called Brave Together with Jessica Pate and you know, iTunes, uh, Spotify, Amazon, and Stitcher um, are where we're at. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Jessica, for being here and sharing your story and your organization with us. I know a lot of people in my audience are really going to benefit from this information. So thank you, Sarah. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, And that will wrap up this week's episode of Caregiver Chronicles. If you'd like to support our show, there is a link to do so on our website, Stell Mac Brown Media. Um, but the really the best way to support our show is to share this episode with a friend um, or all your friends or everybody you know who has a friend who is a special needs mom. 